Hi, everybody. Uh, as I say, thanks so much to Ashley for uh, for holding court there. Uh, it is an absolute honor to have uh, my fellow front end master, uh, front end master's instructor. Front end master sounds very uh, uh, profound, but fellow front end master's instructor uh, Lucas with us. And it's uh, we were honestly doing this partly so that Lucas and I could get a nice dinner together. Um, we managed to schedule it so I'd be in LA at the same time and we were very excited to and Lucas and I both take notes on each other's uh, talks all the time and sort of learn from each other's instruction uh, style and um, yet of course now we are all at home. There we go. Nevertheless, we are very, very, very grateful to have Lucas on. Lucas, forgive me if I can say a few words on your background for folk here and uh, sort of share um, you know, the, the impact you've had. Uh, so for me, most significantly, Lucas is a uh, role model in the engineering community. Uh, somebody who uh, puts together thoughtful curriculum that I, I was saying this recently, why doesn't engineering instruction just explain? Just explain it. Uh, and Lucas is uh, somebody who just explains it. Um, at Brebug, he's uh, VP of Developer Growth. Uh, he's been a developer a advocate at Udacity. Um, but as I say, the thing most close to my heart is he is an instructor on front end masters, uh, particularly around Angular, uh, which is, as everyone knows, the number one uh, UI framework in the world and uh, requiring a lot of additional layers of understanding above core JavaScript. And if you can bring those intuitive models to it the way Lucas does, uh, you have a huge, huge edge. Uh, so he's going to talk today about programming principles. And uh, my understanding is similarly through the, the lens of just explain it, you know, just go for the intuitions as opposed to the highfalutin uh, explanations that many people follow. Uh, and we've got a wonderful audience here. Uh, I know that Lucas will be excited to um, uh, take questions as well, I'm sure. Uh, I would keep it uh, fairly minimal, we know, from our approaches of doing all these workshops in the chat so that people can focus on what Lucas is sharing. Uh, but I'll let him set up uh, with you how that all works. Uh, but we have a wonderful group of people here from, as I can see, around the world. It's fun to, to put your name in people and then the city you're in so we can see where you're all at. Uh, if you do sort of, let me just show you what I'll, I'll do it here for mine. So world sentence and then, well, there's literally in New York. Uh, oh, there you go. And that's, uh, that's where I am. But everyone else, you can do the same as well. But I think without further ado, I'm going to pass to Lucas. Uh, and again, thank you so much, my friend. It's lovely, lovely to see you. And we are going to do dinner once this is all, all over. Thank you, Lucas. Over to you, my friend. Thank you, Will. Um, so interesting. I had no idea that Will felt that way about me. Um, being a, a fellow front end master, um, I think really good engineers, um, they're constantly learning. And so I've, I've actually watched a lot of Will's courses. And it's been really interesting because on one hand, I'm like, I didn't actually know that, or that's a little nugget. As an instructor I'm watching, I'm like, I really like how he unpacked that, or I really liked how he said that. So for me, it's always a, a double uh, portion when I get to watch Will's courses. And so, um, you know, being here is, I think, one of the greatest honors. Um, as an engineer, I've made so many friends across the world, and uh, according to Zoom, uh, 71 and counting. So I just, I love to talk about programming. I love to program. And I'm making the brash, bold assumption that everybody is here to be a little better programmer. And so with that uh, said, let's uh, just get started. We have a lot of material here. And I'm going to do hopefully what Will said, and that is instead of talking about highfalutin concepts, I'm actually going to explain programming in the simplest possible framework that I can possibly uh, think of. And where this, the impetus for this uh, workshop came from is I was 
I was talking about some stuff to uh, some of my employees and, and I got a little frustrated and, and I just kind of blurted out. I'm like, guys, this is not this hard. Like I can explain everything that we're doing here on a single piece of paper and being inquisitive employees, they said, well, like, why don't you explain what that is? And so as I started to really think about it, I realized that it's not even a single piece of paper. When I program, I'm doing the same four things over and over. And there's just permutations of those. But instead of programming becoming more and more complex, I've actually reduced it to these four basic patterns that I think if I could go back in time 20 years ago, it would have really simplified things that allowed me to focus on, on the things that matter. And it's not, though I do Angular, I do a lot of things. At the end of the day, when you dig in and you understand the core fundamental concepts of programming, you can go from language to language, you can go from framework to framework. And so my goal here is to just kind of unpack this, show you a way of thinking about programming. And from here, we can start to, to build on that. So um, hopefully everybody can hear me. It looks like my audio was good on my end, but um, so perfect. So with that said, let me share my screen and let's get started. All right. So four fundamental programmatic concepts with JavaScript. With that said, there is one caveat, and that is just moving this chat over here. All right. Four fundamental programmatic concepts with JavaScript. Well, the first couple of times I, I did this, I started talking about TypeScript. And it was like I just ripped people off. Like I'd done a bait and switch. They're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like we're talking about JavaScript and you're talking about TypeScript. And so I just made this caveat here, like and TypeScript, you know, asterisks. And I'll talk about why in a moment, but we're going to talk about JavaScript and TypeScript. So the goal is to understand the fundamental elements necessary for mastering programming. So we're gonna just unpack this a little bit. We're not gonna get in a rush. The first piece, I'm just really going to take my time and explain this model about how I see programming. But spoiler alert, we're gonna talk about objects, methods, decisions, and collections. And so that's kind of the showing the end of the movie before we get there. Uh, but this is what we're going to work through. And the examples I'm going to do is just TypeScript. You could also do it in JavaScript. It's going to be in StackBlitz. So if you just go to StackBlitz, so I'll just go over here. If you go down, click on TypeScript, what you're going to get is a pretty basic starter. And I'm going to be just programming out of here from scratch. And uh, please follow along. I'm also going to have a couple of challenges. We'll break this up just to help reinforce uh, some of the things that I'm talking about. And uh, from there, let's see what we can build. So our world in code. So let's go back 25 years ago. Tw I've been programming for about 20 years. I tried a few times before that, didn't really work out, but I was just this young, very eager individual and I remember it felt like I was going to somebody who knew how to program. And I was saying, like, please, like, teach me how to program. Teach me the secrets of programming. And eventually they would relent. And it really felt like, like, look, I want to be in an elevator shaft, like hacking the mainframe. And I'm over here painting fences. Why am I doing this? And so it's like, well, let's start here. And you, you do a bunch of stuff and you're like, I have no idea why this is happening. And then my mentors, knowing what they knew, would say, now let's do this. And so we'd kind of go and we'd wax the car for a little bit. And so obviously I'm making some Karate Kid references here. Um, hopefully everybody's seen that movie or these, um, the frame of reference might be a little off, but I love the movie. So here we go. And then they would ask me to do some stuff that like made no sense at all. It's like, this is going to get weird. And then it's going to get really weird. 
And so I spent the first kind of initial part of my programming career in just this, the state of just confusion, doing a ton of stuff that I didn't really understand. All I knew is that eventually I wanted to be in an elevator shaft, hacking into the mainframe, doing amazing stuff because that's what they did in sneakers and done deal. But I began to realize that we do this kind of stuff very slow, very intentional. We slow it down. And all of a sudden, when we spend enough time doing this, when we get into these situations here, all the time you spent in intentional practice and in laying a strong fundamental foundation is going to pay off. And so when it's two in the morning and things are crashing and you're seeing something you've never seen before, all of a sudden you'll realize that I'm actually equipped to work through this, that as much as I, I love Angular, React, if you only understand a framework and you don't understand the underlying design decisions, the minute you're out of that specific domain, you're lost. It's like a classical musician who ever, only ever learned how to read notes. The minute you put them in a situation where they need to improvise, it's a real problem. And so by stepping back, learning the fundamentals, being intentional in this situation or this setting, which is what we are now, that when you get into these situations, these high torque, high pressure, high pressure situations, you'll have the tools to incrementally work through the problem. And so it's the ability to, to problem solve and think through things that's way more important than any language or framework that you can know. So uh, Will talks a lot about this in his course and I just, I echo the sentiment. So as I was programming over the course of my career, I realized I was essentially doing the same four things over and over. I was describing things, I was performing actions, I was making decisions, and then I was repeating that via iteration, which is data structures, functions, conditions, iterators. And so I can take the most complex piece of code that I've written right now, any, any client that I have pulled the most complex piece of code and I can distill it down to these four things. I'm describing things, I'm performing actions, I'm making decisions, and I'm repeating that via iteration. That's it. You take React, Angular, Vue, and at the end of the day, I believe this is what you're doing. You're working with data structures, functions, conditionals, and iterators. And What's really interesting, I realized that I had been doing these things since I was a very small child. Intuitively, we already understand how to do these things. Where we get hung up is we, don't, we haven't translated that into the ability to express it in code, and more importantly, composite these things into a meaningful way. So let's do a thought exercise. These are donuts. I love donuts. In fact, anytime I do one of these things, I'm like, oh God, like don't let the internet go down. I promise I'll never eat another donut. And then I typically go back on that. But what we have here is three trays of donuts. We have a blue tray, a green tray, and an orange tray. So this makes sense, everybody. We're looking at three trays of donuts, blue, green, orange. So I could say to a five-year-old, do you see those trays of donuts? Do you see the green tray? On that tray, find all the donuts that have sprinkles on them, bring them back to me. Would we agree that probably a five-year-old could understand those instructions? Like, do you see the tray of donuts? Do you see the green tray? On that tray, find all the donuts that have sprinkles on them and bring them back to me. self explained I, I, I'm certain I would bet $100 that everybody in this room right now, if there was three trays of donuts, I could say this to them and they would have no problem executing these sets of instructions. Well, here we go. So 
Do you see the trays? Okay. Find the tray that's green. And so you look at the three trays, you iterate over them, and you say, what's the tray color? Well, it's green. Okay, this is my selected tray. Then I'm going to look at my donuts, and I'm going to go over the donuts. I'm going to say, does this donut have sprinkles? If it does, I'm going to set it aside. And from there, child.fetch sprinkle donuts. And so all we've done is taken something that we just intuitively know and converted this into code. And it's that, that leap of being able to take something very basic that we understand and express it in code. So uh, yes, the slides will be shared afterwards. I'll send them out and uh, anybody can and download them and reference them. So this is one of my favorite books. This is, I think, one of the most important books that I read as a programmer. And what's interesting is Robert C. Martin or Uncle Bob, he spends the entire book talking about doing less. Write less code. Write smaller functions. Write less comments. Write functions that, you, that explain what it does so you don't have to write functions. It was, it was common sense. And what he managed to do is really capture this idea of instead of doing more, adding complexity, actually reduce complexity and do less, but do it better. All right, so with that said, we're gonna do a quick TypeScript interlude. So this is, so nobody feels like I've done a bait and switch. This is why we're doing this. So what do we mean when we talk about that's really poor grammar, by the way. We talk about plain old JavaScript. What, what is that? When we talk about plain old JavaScript, we're talking about ECMAScript 5. The reason being is because this is what really browsers understand by default. And so if you wanted to express, let's say, a shape that you could set a location on or get a location, this is what this looks like. This is how you do object-oriented programming in ES5. And somebody would look at this and be like, this is like, how would I even know that this is, is supposed to approximate a class? So this is how I learned object-oriented programming. It was not super fun, not super awesome. So along came ES6, and all of a sudden now we got the ergonomics and the, I think the shape of it became a, a, a little better, a lot better, a lot more descriptive. Because I said, well, look at the class shape. Well, they'd be like, oh, it's called class shape. And let's call the set location method. Well, oh, you mean the set location method in the class? That makes a lot of sense. So this is a class, a shape class in ES5, which is a little bit baffling. This is what it looks like in ES6, a lot better. In TypeScript, you can take it a step further and you can say, when I pass an X and Y, or when I set X and Y, it's a type number. I also want to set the access modifier for ID to be private because I really want to constrain access to this class, at least at um, authoring time. So at compile time, that gets stripped away, but when you're writing code and you try to access a private modifier, or a private member, it will say, oh, you're not allowed to do this. So the reason why I like this is because we're starting to have some boundaries, or more importantly, this class is communicating to me what it's supposed to be and what I can do with it and how I can interact with it. And so you see, even we have shape or we have X and Y, well, I think we're trying to talk about location. So what I can do is I can actually describe a location object and say, when we're talking about X and Y, we're really talking about the shape's location. And so I'm able to create an interface and determine like, this is what this is. And so we're just getting a little bit more clear on what we are using or how this thing is supposed to work and what it does and what it means. And so we're going to use TypeScript because it's better at communicating intention not only to yourself when you're looking at what does this do, but to your IDE, and more importantly, to your team members. But at the end of the day, it's just JavaScript. I can pull that stuff out and it's still going to work. 
All right. Deep breath. We've covered quite a bit of material in about 20 minutes. So I want to take a break for just a second. Does anybody have any questions about what I've just said? So what is interface? I will explain that in this next section. Good. Has anybody heard of the book, um, Salt, Fat, Heat, and Acid? So there's actually a, um, it's on Netflix, uh, but it's a book by uh, this lady and she basically distilled cooking into these four basic things. So a very similar thing. I absolutely love how she approached cooking. So I came up with kind of these four things about the same time I found this book and it was really interesting how she was able to do the same thing with cooking. So just a little thing, if you are interested in cooking or culinary arts, this is a great, um, it's a great book. It's a really good uh, show. So uh, let's see, I, I saw a few questions real quick. I'll explain what an interface is in just a second. TypeScript is just a superset of JavaScript. So it compiles down to JavaScript, but there's just some extra pieces that make it easier, or I think it improves the, the developer ergonomics and the experience. All right, let's dig into this, let's go. All right, objects is nouns. This is the first piece. Fundamentally, when we program, what are we doing? Well, let's start. We're gonna wax the car for a bit. We're just gonna do some stuff. And if you know this, just bear with us, but we're building a foundation and we're just gonna wax the car. So we describe things as objects. At the end of the day, we are modeling the world around us by capturing them and describing them as objects. So for instance, we could see a car and we could have a car object. And I could say, well, what color is that car? And you could say red, what's the make? You could say Nissan, what's the model, Ultima. And so what we have here in this client object is first name, last name, company. So these are properties such as make, model, that we assign values to them. And it's those values on those properties that make that object unique. But at the end of the day, we are just describing the world around us. And so when you're solving a business problem, you have to ask yourself, what are the objects that are in play here? And I really, believe it or not, I typically find data modeling to be one of the, the more complicated things that when I'm starting a new application that I spend the most time thinking about. What do I actually want to call the objects? How do I want to divide them? You know, what are the, the properties that I want to assign to them? And really thinking about in this complex world, how do I break these down into objects that really captures what is happening? And so we're describing things as objects. So we have a client object with four properties, ID, first name, last name, company. Now, we can also use an object to describe really anything, including a, a new client, for instance, in this case, that it's an empty object, but it's a placeholder for something that's going to have values in the future. And so a lot of times, if I'm filling out like a new client form, I'll initialize it with an empty object, that is I'm filling it in, the values then fill in this object. But we're just describing a thing that exists in our world. Next piece, we can use classes as blueprints to create objects. And so we're describing client as an object over here. Well, let's say we need more than one. We can use a class to define a blueprint that says, when I call new client, it's going to return this object or an object. So think of classes simply as blueprints to determine or define what object is going to be created or returned when I call new. So we have raw, plain old JavaScript objects. We have classes 
that define a blueprint that we can then reuse over and over. And so in this case, I could say client equals new client. And I pass in Tony Stark, Stark Industries. And what that does is it sets properties on this client object. And so I realize here, this Iron Man should actually be client. So I'll fix that before I send the slides out. Um, but if I would have said Iron Man equals new client, there we go. So it's a concrete instance. Now, what we can also do is we can have a collection of objects. We can have more than one. So, I mean, I would imagine that if I said, make me a list of your friends, that hopefully you have more than one. And so what you would have to do is create an array and put all your friends in there. And so I have all sorts of friends that I've just made. So I said, how many friends did I make tonight? It would be a friends array, new friends array. Every one of you would be in here. First name, last name, city. I think we also asked that. So, oh no, Philip, well, you have two because you got me. So now we have a collection of objects. So it's a way to have more than one. All right, so we've talked about plain objects. Classes is blueprints to create new objects. And then what we can do is we say, when we create an object, we need it to behave a certain way. We need to create a contract, essentially, that when this object is created, we need to know that it's going to have an ID, first name, last name, company. And so think of an interface as is a contract for any object or class that implements it. So the way that I think about this, um, I live in a housing development and we have an HOA, uh, I spit on the ground, <laughs> uh, they're not my friend. And they basically have this thing where it's like, if your house is in the HOA or in the neighborhood, you have to adhere to certain things. So I came home one day, my wife had painted the door blue. It looked amazing. Three days later, I get a letter in the mail. They're like, nope, sorry, no blue doors. It's gotta be boring brown. And so basically we had violated the HOA contract or interface for how our houses should look. So interfaces is contracts. So now what we can do is we can say every object in this array has to be of type client. And so every object in here has ID, first name, last name, company. And so I'm talking about this, but I'll show this in code in just a minute. We'll walk through it and then everybody can do a challenge. So what we call here, we call this a strong collection or a strongly typed collection because now without, if I put my hand over the array, it, like the values in, I just say, what's in here? I can say, oh, well, that's an array of client objects. Outside of TypeScript, you're not able to do that. But if you violate that contract or that interface, then the IDE is able to tell you like, hey, you know, you're missing something here. It could cause problems. And so this is a way to say, I'm creating this thing and it needs to adhere to this set of criteria. Again, all we're doing is describing the world around us. So we can attach it to objects or classes. So we could say, well, if I create a VIP client, it needs to implement client. So objects, we're just describing the world around us. You have properties, you have values, you have classes, interfaces, and then you can have a collection of objects and you can even strongly type that. So this is the part in the movie where if anybody's seen Karate Kid, they can vouch for this. But basically, Daniel's son, just he gets fed up. He's like, I'm not painting the fence anymore. Like, I'm sick of waxing the car. And Mr. Miyagi goes, okay, punch me. It's basically punch me. And Daniel's son's like, okay. And he goes to punch him. And all of a sudden, like, he waxes the car and blocks his punch. And so it's this pretty, like, climatic scene where it's like all of a sudden he realizes like I've been waxing the car and like painting the fence but really what I've been learning how to do is block punches and block kicks and I actually know more than I thought I did so this is this look right before that basically say okay like let's apply some of this stuff so we've been waxing the car 
let's let's drill it down. So let's describe, let's think of an application. And let's say we have clients and we want to describe our client state. Okay, so let's think about that. I have an application, I have clients. Okay, so we definitely wanna have clients in there because hopefully we have more than one. And quite possibly, you know, if we're working with a single client, we want to set current client. And so I'm creating an interface and I'm saying, I'm gonna call this client state. And we're going to give it a client's property with an array of client objects, a current client, which is just a client object. And then let's see what this looks like. So remember, client state has clients and current client. And then we create initial state, which adheres to this, it implements this interface, client state. And so it has to have two properties, clients and current client. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to set current client to just an empty client. And I think if I'm not mistaken, all right. So we're gonna have some challenges here in just a moment, but what I wanna do is let me show you this in code. All right, can everybody see my code okay? I feel like possibly it could be a little bigger. So in chats, real quick, if you can see it okay, give me a thumbs up. If I could make it bigger, give me a thumbs. It's good? All right, so I'm seeing some thumbs up. Perfect. All right, so let's talk about clients. What does a client look like? Well, let's make this pretty simple. Let's just go with, we'll just go client. So we're just gonna start from the beginning. Let's type this out. So client equals one, uh, first name equals John, last name equals Wick, and we'll leave it at that. So pretty simple. And then what I'm going to do, just a little pro tip, um, I'm gonna go down here and I'm gonna just dump this into the screen so we can see it. So um, I use the pre-tag all the time and you'll see why in just a moment. And uh, then we're gonna go JSON stringify. We'll go client in this case, null, two because we're going to set this to two tabs and I feel like oh right and then from here all right cool so all I'm doing is I'm taking this object and I'm just dumping it over here so thumbs up for me winning so let's strongly type this so we're going to go and we're going to go interface client and we're just going to say this needs an id we're going to make this a string so i just recommend if you're ever mocking out data make your id a string not a number um, you have many more options when you do that and databases generally return um, you know alphanumeric sequences never one two three four string and last name is string. Okay, now what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna take off last name. So right now, everything's cool. If I type this, I'm gonna say this is client. Notice right away, I get this squiggly line. I say, hey, you're missing last name. Like, so this is important. This is why we create interfaces to enforce conformity across our application. So then I go here and I go last name, is wick and everything is awesome all right again i'm not doing anything super fancy here i'm just describing the world that i live in so now let's think about this application that we have with clients so interface we'll call this clients state and what do we want in here? So again, we said, well, let's do clients. And this is just going to be an array of clients. So this is just 
shorthand for this. So you're saying a client, but it's an array of type clients. And we'll go with current client. And this is just going to be a client object. So again, pretty straightforward, client state. And then what I can do is I want to create initial state. And I'm going to just call this client state. equals, and I'm going to type this. So it's going to basically make sure that I am adhering to the contract. So right now you can see it's saying like, look, you're missing a bunch of stuff. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to, we'll go client, and I'm just going to put in an empty array. Hopefully we'll see that it's, uh, well, I'm throwing an error just a second. And oh, yes, we'll get to that in a second. So current client equals an empty object. And it's saying like, okay, well, you're still missing some stuff. So what I can do is I can go ID to first name, Miles, last name, Morales. All of a sudden now, check it out, like it's happy. But we have a small problem. Well, for one, like we've embedded this object in here. And so let's extract that. So let's create our clients array and we'll go client equals. And I'm just going to put my first client in here. And then I'm going to paste, oops, I'm gonna paste this in here. And so notice client is a client object. This generic object in here adheres to the interface. And so this is happy. And so what I can do now is I could go, I wanna assign clients to this client's property. Now, because it's ES6, because they have the same name, I can just shorthand, just say this. Now, what I need to do, I'm going to go const new client, and I'm just going to create an empty object that adheres to this interface. Okay. And notice now that everything is happy. And so I can go down here, we'll dump initial client state in here. And notice that I now have an array of clients and the current client is the empty client. So I don't feel like I'm doing anything magical here. We're just describing the world around us, but I can guarantee you at some point, you're going to go out into the real world and you're going to be asked to write an application and you're going to stop and you're going to be like, okay, I'm building this feature. What properties and values do I need to capture for this to work? And so in the case of clients, let's say, well, we need more than one client and we need a current client. And so this right here, believe it or not, you will do this many, many times of I'm going to define the shape of the state for this feature or this thing that I'm working on. All right. Now, I believe that I have covered everything. Yes. I see a raised hand here. Hop right in. What is the question? Oh, hi there. Can you hear me? Yes. I like to talk thus far. I, I just um, I have a question for you about when defining defining interfaces in TypeScript. If in production in, in production environments, if you need to make modifications to some of these clients, let, let's say that you had a client that had an ID, a first and a last name, and then they needed an extra property that the other client objects don't have. How do you deal with cases where? Um, you you define a pattern or an object in a, in a specific way at the beginning, and then later on the project, the requirements change, 
and uh, you you need to adapt your your objects, your interfaces, without um, without creating an anti pattern in your code. Yes. So this is obviously a somewhat trivial. Like it's in a vacuum. Like we're doing this, but imagine you had a large scale application mm -hmm. with many, many clients and everybody, you know, a large distributed team. And what you're doing is you're creating consensus that, okay, we're using this client object and everybody is agreed on, like, this is what this is. And so on one hand, like you're enforcing conformity across the, the application. And so it would be really bad if somebody just came in and said, oh, you know, we're going to add in, you know, this new thing, which is, you know, astral signature. Sure. Yeah. You know, and so all of a sudden now we have to enforce this across the entire application. Now, typically on large applications, you'll have kind of a core team that's responsible for coordinating this. But what you can do is if you find something that, look, I need it in this feature, but I don't need it in these other features you can do something like, well, you can make it optional. And so I can come here and so you can see right now client, like everything is kind of red and squiggly. Well, if I put a question mark in here, I'm saying this could have it, but it's not required. And so it's an optional property. So this is, this is a very, very good question. And I love how you're kind of thinking at scale, how does this work? Like, how do we do this without creating an anti-pattern? Well, Typically what you can do here, and I use this quite frequently, is I can say, look, if you're a client, you absolutely have to have one of these core set of properties. And what we can also do is you have these optional set of properties here. And so you just signify this with a question mark. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. That's, that's a very good way of dealing with that. optional, optional properties. Client? Can you apply this to uh, classes in JavaScript? Yes, absolutely. And so you can apply interfaces to objects and classes. So classes, when you call new, it generates an object. And so really I think of classes as just kind of future objects. Mm -hmm. And so you definitely apply, um, you can definitely apply interfaces to classes and you should. And I won't always do it, but you know, if it makes sense or it helps, um, communicate intent, absolutely. And so Thank one you. thing I'm one thing I'm doing, I'm getting, I'm gonna freestyle just a bit. This is by prerogative, and this is why I love doing this, is when you have an interface, your you can program to the interface and not the concrete instance. And so this is I'm gonna just this is a concept that once I grasped, it became really, really powerful. So for instance, I could have a and this is all freestyle off the top of my head, a pet. And let's say a pet has a name and it has, I don't know, legs, which is a number. And let's just leave it at that. Now what I can do is I can create cat, which is of type pet, and it has a name of Fluffy and legs of four. And I have a small typo here. Okay, so name is, oh wait, hold on. Did I mess this up? Type Fluffy is not assignable to string. I find that, oh, right because I put the string in the string. All right, so I have a cat, it's of type pet. Now what I can do is I can create a frog and I can also say this is a pet and it has a name of, oh, I don't know, Prince Charming, legs, oh, dang it. Frogs have four legs too, stupid. All right, I'm gonna keep going until I can create a variation of this. Uh, spider, <clears throat> I, I think we get the idea. And so what yeah. I can do is I'm describing more than one thing, but because they apply to the interface, 
then what we can do is we can know things about it without knowing the concrete implementation of it. And so on an interface, I can not only define properties, but methods. So I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but what I can do here is I can say speak and it's a function. And I'm not gonna take this all the way to its conclusion. And I think I may have to do this like this. But I can say like, I wanna speak and this is a function. And now if I go speak, in this case, it's gonna be console log meow. And so this is a very like specific implementation because a cat meows. This would be a really good place for me to make a, what does the fox say joke? Um, ribbit. Now notice the concrete implementation, the object, it's different, but because it applies it, the interface, it adheres to this contract, I can now pass these around. So I can have a function that says, um, speak and I can pass in a pet and it could be so we're basically saying it's we don't know exactly what it is we just know that it's a pet and I can go pet speak and then from here I can call make pet speak cat and I should spell this right and I can go make pet speak, and I can go. And if I look in the console here, meow ribbit. And so again, even though we did a small detour, all that we're doing is we're describing our objects and what it does. And so this idea of programming to an interface is really, really powerful. So I didn't intend to get into this, but um, we'll just chalk this up as bonus material. High five. Everybody's welcome. Um, you will definitely use this in the real world. Uh, but with that said, I think it's time to write some code ourselves. So I'm going to issue a challenge. And so when we are playing interface, we're doing some type of inheritance. No. So inheritance I'll get into that in just a little bit. So inheritance is saying, this is what this thing does, or this is what this should do. So you're describing something. Inheritance is saying, this is what you can do. And it's, it's imparting essentially functionality. And for various reasons, I get into this maybe at the end of this, I recommend really avoiding inheritance at all costs. Rarely ever do I use it. Um, but I've seen situations where you get this deep inheritance, like six, classes deep. So this is a real problem in JavaScript. And all of a sudden it's like, where's this functionality coming from? Well, it's in your parent, 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 parent class that you inherited from. And you have no way of knowing where that is, or you're even afraid to touch it because it affects everything downstream. So interface is simply saying, this is what this is. Inheritance is saying, this is what you're going to do. So the pattern interface is, I would say, part of composition. I would say more so polymorphism is that it doesn't matter what's happening. It's just, we're able to interchange these. So what you saw me do with the cat and the frog, that's polymorphism. So because they adhere to the interface, I can use one or the other. Um, so very, very good questions. Yeah, I mean, I would, I think so. Okay, so we don't run out of time. Let's get into our challenge. And what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna put this up here. And I'm going to go use the restroom. So if you need to take, let's just take a quick 10 minutes to, to do this. So if you need to go get water, use the restroom, uh, whatever. We've actually been at this for just about an hour. So we're right on time. Um, I want you to create an object that represents a client project. Add some properties to your new project object. Create an interface. Create an array of project objects. So this is everything that I just did. Create an interface that represents project state. So this is really important and then create an initial state object that implements the project state interface. So 
real quick, if anybody was savvy, I would say, take a screenshot, but don't do that. You're cheating yourself. This right here basically is what I'm wanting you to do, but instead of clients, use projects. What I'm also going to do, let's see how well this works. I'm gonna paste this into the group chat um, just in case you're wondering what I actually did at the bottom to get that to, to lay out. And so it's 7.21, uh, my time, so uh, I'm in Arizona. And so let's say it's 7.30 Pacific Daylight Time. Uh, we'll pick this up and we'll get into the next module. Um, use this opportunity to do the challenges, grab some water, use the restroom, go get a latte, and um, we'll be right back in about nine minutes. So, all right, we're just about at time. And for the sake of time, I'm just gonna jump in and um, I'm going to do the challenge myself. You can follow along um, and check your work. I want, um, as a kid, I used to hate my mom's cooking and I would say, mom, I don't wanna eat this. And she would say, well, I wouldn't make anything that I wouldn't eat myself and because I'm eating it, so are you. So uh, I'm going to do this um, challenge and you can see, and it's not going to be perfect or exactly the same, uh, but let's get into this. So we'll go project and I need to think, what do I want on a project? Well, I definitely want an ID and what else? Maybe a title. And this is a project, a description, my dream project. And then from here, let's go completed and we'll go false. Okay. And so I can just drop it in here. We can see, great. So let me do the interface. By the way, somebody is not on mute. So if you could check and do that, I'm hearing some keyboard clicks and, and whatnot. So um, let's go interface. So what do, what do we defined here? ID, title, description, completed. So let's capture that in an interface. We'll go ID string, title, string, description, string, and completed. So this is of type what? Well, it's either true or false. So it's Boolean. There we go. Now, just for fun, I'm going to set this to a string. We'll apply the project interface to it. And as you expected, this was not happy. So we'll set this to false and we're very good. So now let's think about, this is gonna be very similar. Interface is going to be projects state. We'll go projects or project rather, because it's a, an array of single project objects. And we'll go with current projects. So you'll find as well that there's going to be a lot of, um, once you kind of establish on some good patterns, a lot of conventional uh, practices here. So this will just be a project. Okay, so hopefully this is not surprising to anyone here. And then let's create our projects array. Again, it's just a single project object that we have more than one. And let's go <clears throat> and we'll just put this project in here. Okay. And I'm gonna, yeah. Then what we'll do is let's create our initial state. So we'll go initial projects state. And of course, let's implement the interface. And we'll say projects. And remember, we can shorthand because I could go projects equals projects, but because it's the same name. And we'll also go current project is project. 
Wadata. So pretty straightforward, but as you start to design features and build out applications, you will spend a lot of time modeling that domain saying, oh, we have clients, we have projects, whatever. And um, that's how that works. So with that said, let's move on to the next module. Methods, it's verbs. So obviously we have objects, but we need them to do things. So we're going to wax the car. So when would you recommend to use a class instead of an interface? Well, you wanna use a class when you need a concrete instance of something and you use an interface to describe what that concrete instance looks like. And so you use them in conjunction. And so it's never really, or generally you don't do one or the other. So the answer is you use classes or you can use raw object depending on what you're doing. And then you use an interface to essentially enforce conformity on that class or object. So good question, Alvaro. All right, so we need to do something. So we have an object. We think of these as nouns. Let's think of, of methods or functions as verbs. So in this case, we have a function, it's called select client. And what we wanna do is it takes two parameters, not important, and it just returns an object. So this is a classic function, the classic shape. Now we're going to modify this a little bit and we're going to use a fat arrow function. And so I could streamline this a little bit, but for the sake of brevity, I'm gonna just kind of stop here. All I've done is I've removed function and on the left side and on the right side, I just put this fat arrow. So equals um, greater than sign. So this is just a fat arrow. So this is the way to express or just a streamlined way to express a function in ES6 or TypeScript. All right, so now what we can do is we can call the method for the function. So select client, pass it in. More importantly is that we can capture and store the results of that method or that operation. So think of you know, methods is that it does something and then it returns, it has some result that you want to capture. So I just want to make a quick distinction here that you can call the method more importantly and more often more often than not you're going to store the results and then now what you can do is you can take methods and you can add them to objects so we saw that in the previous module or you can add them to classes and so remember a class is a blueprint for an object and you can say here's the properties i want on this object that what i create but I also want to add these methods. So I wanna give this object the ability to do something. So you could say, I have a car class and it has make, model, year, but then I also need it to drive, stop, honk. And so think of it as a lot of times we have a data structure, but we need it to do stuff. And so this is a class extending this conversation is it has properties, it's a data structure, but you can add functionality or verbs to this object. Well, guess what? We've understand this our entire life. It's a very familiar concept that we have objects that have characteristics, but then these objects also can do things and they are defined by their behavior and their capabilities. So in this case, we, can, we have a client store well, we can load clients, we can read the clients, select a client, create a client. We can do all these things. And so now I'm creating a new client store and lo and behold, on that object, I can now call methods. I can now call load, I can call select, and I can call create. So this is really just nouns and verbs and in a really, kind of advanced functional world, you actually are able to separate these out. But for now, we'll think of classes as things, 
that have properties and that can also do stuff or perform actions. So nouns and verbs. So we just kind of waxed on, painted the fence. So let's apply this now. Let's, let's see what this looks like. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to define a store class that has a state property. And then I want it to do two things. I want it to get state, and I also want it to select a slice of state. And so what this looks like, and we'll see this in code just a moment, is when I call get state, all it does is return the value that it has for this state, whatever is stored there, that it just returns that. Or if I want to select a slice of state, it just returns that piece. And so let's see what this looks like. So things, I'm kind of actually giddy because I, like I know where this is going, but we're, things are starting to get interesting. So hop into the code. I'm going to delete this project stuff here uh, just to keep kind of the code uh, a little bit concise. And I'm going to create a class and I'm going to call this store. Okay. And I want this class to have a property. And I'm going to call this state. And we'll give it a property of client's state. Okay. Initial project state. Oh, right. Okay. So now it's a class, it's undefined, but what we can do is I can now do this. I can go const store equals new store. Okay. And let's pass this in. And what I'll do just for clarity, we'll call this the client store. Save. Trace this out and notice state, there's nothing in here because we haven't put anything in there yet. And so I could even go state. And we can see here it's undefined because I haven't set it to be anything just yet. So let's create the ability to do that. So I can do it a couple ways. So I'm going to do this kind of the unelegant way. So I can go client store dot client or state equals initial client state. Oh, well now we have something because I'm saying this object has a property of state I'm going to set it. And so notice here, when I dump this out into the code, it's just an object. But because I have a state property on here, the state property then has the client state object on it. What I can even do just for fun is I can say, you know, foo equals bar. And notice, it's just a property. It's just a data structure. I'm just describing state or the world around me. It's just a data structure. Some of the properties in this case happen to be methods. All right, so now what I prefer not to do is this directly. I want to actually, for the, it to be created, the store object with state already initialized. And so we'll create a constructor and we're going to take in a state variable and I'm just gonna go this state equals state. Now notice here, it's saying, well, when we create this, this constructor is saying it needs a property, like it doesn't have it, what's up? So again, this is why we use TypeScript because it'll catch this and I'll just pass in initial client state. Boom, here we are, it's setting it. Now what I can do is I'm going to create a method. I'm gonna call get state. 
And I'm saying, I want the ability to get the current state. All I do is I just go return this state. So now, if I just want to get the state, I could call it directly, but what I prefer to do is, instead of reaching and grabbing that method or that property, is I like to create an accessor method that kind of does that for me because, for instance, I may want to control how this array is returned or how state is returned. And so you can put some logic in here to control that. But now if I go get state and I call this, notice it's just returning state. So I'm just giving the ability for this store object to perform this unit of work. But what if I want to just get the current client? Well, what I can do here is I can say select, I'm gonna pass in a key. And so you can think of key as just a property on an object. And I'm going to go this, return this state. And then using object notation, I can go key. Okay, and so now what I can do is, and I'm going to just close this down. We'll get a little bit more room here. I can go select, and instead I can say, I want to get current client. Pretty simple. So what I've done is I've said, I want an object. I'm gonna call this store. So I wanna capture the state. I wanna store it here, and then I want to create the ability to access it. So. I want to get state and I want to be able to select a slice of it off of it. So again, taking a very simple object and I realize I feel like I'm taking these like these micro steps, but this is the point because we're building something, we're going somewhere. And so we've created a store object. It has a state property. And we're giving it the ability, we're giving it essentially two verbs, get state and select. And select takes a value, you pass it in, and then it performs some unit of work and it returns that. So what I could do down here is I could go const current client. Let me make sure, yep. And so let's say I needed to get the current client. Well, I could go here clients store select current client and then i can just come down here and so i'm restoring the return value of this and so and i'm just saying perform this operation give it to me and then this is what i'm going to store so now imagine you had a component and you say, I need to get the current client so I can display it. Well, this is where this would come in. All right, so we're taking these incremental steps and we're going somewhere. So let's take a small interlude into a challenge and let's extend this a little more. So what I want you to do, and so when I, I kind of do something, um, if you pay attention and follow along, I think it will be really easy to do these challenges is create a project store. So hopefully you still have your code from the last challenge add a state property to the class, add a constructor that accepts a state parameter, add a get state method and a select method. And then what I want you to do is instantiate the project store class with the initial state object and then call select on the class to get the project's collection. You can also do current project. So I leave that up to you, but what I'm going to do is I'm just really quick, sleight of hand, I'm gonna flip over here. And if you wanna see what this looks like, hopefully nobody is taking a screenshot. Well, so what I'm saying is, in this case, line 38 is necessary because I'm saying I'm defining this property 
but I'm not setting it to anything until the constructor. So watch what happens. If I take this out, this whole thing breaks because it's like, I don't, I don't know what state is. And so here, once I add it back in, then it's like, oh, here it is. And so this is why you need line 38 because this defines the property, this sets a value to the property. And so they do two very different things. And so you're saying, I need to define this property and then I need to set it. Because if I take this off, what it's gonna do, it's gonna say it, the property doesn't exist. So hopefully that makes sense, is you need 38 to set the property or define it. And then you need, so if I go here and I go like this dot, foo equals and hopefully it'll say again it doesn't exist either all right so can we see where client state is defined well this hopefully you were doing it in the previous challenge but client state has clients and current clients and so, um, yeah, that's where that is. Make sense? So what you can also, you can infer because if you look at the initial client state, well, it, it's basically implementing this interface. So it has to have clients and then current client. So, all right, it's 750. This is a pretty straightforward one. So I just want to give five minutes because we're going to run really tight on time. And so let's hop over to this challenge. Hopefully everybody kind of caught where it was. I'm going to take five minutes. I'm going to go grab some water. I'm going to go play a song on the guitar. I'll be back in five minutes and we will pick this up and we're going to get into conditionals. All right. That was quick. Five minutes. <clears throat> so. Let me just do this real quick. Um, I don't really have any projects in here, but I'm gonna comment this out and we're just gonna wing it and I don't expect it to work, but I just wanna make sure that kind of everybody's on the, actually I can do this this way. So class projects store. So this is where we want to store our project state. And so what we're going to do here, we're going to go state and we'll go project state. This doesn't exist in my case. You are going to see some red squigglies. Uh, just bear with me. And then from here, we want a constructor and we want to accept a state property. And we're just going to go this state equals state and get state. And so this is actually going to be pretty much identical to this. So I'm just going to copy this in. And this is pretty much what you should have had. Um, a couple of things you could do as well is you can, um, you could actually type, you know, this parameter. You can type the, this return type here. And you could say this is a string. Um, here, so there's a couple ways that you can you know, further um, clarify what is actually happening. So with that said, let us move on. All right, decisions and conditionals. So not only do we have things, and we have things that perform actions, nouns, and verbs, but eventually you need to make a decision. The classic, should I stay or should I go? And so let's wax the car. So this is actually a pretty, this is I think probably the smallest, simplest module out of all four of them. It just comes down to Boolean expressions. You know, true, like, it, does this equal this? You know, does Batman's secret identity equal Bruce Wayne? 
does the client ID equal the, the payload ID? And so when you're doing a conditional expression, what you're really doing is evaluating something to whether it is true or false. So I use this one pretty frequently is if you have a form and you're creating, let's say a client or you're updating a client, well, it's typically the same exact form. So you don't need to duplicate the form. What I'll do is I'll use the same form for creating or updating an object. The difference is, is if that object, in this case, a client has an ID, in other words, it's been to the database and back, then, or if it doesn't have an ID, I know it's a new object. So I'll create it. If not, I'll go ahead and save it. So this is kind of a, like an upsert pattern is that if it doesn't exist, save it or create it. If it does exist, update it. And so what I'm saying here is if it doesn't have a client ID, in other words, so does it have a client ID? No, which in this case, this Boolean basically flips it to true, and then it will create it. If not, it'll update the client. But we're coming down to, you know, is client ID null or false? So next, what we see here is a ternary operator. So let's strip this code away for a second and let's look at just this piece right here. So does the client ID equal the payload ID? If true, return this. If false, return this. And so we'll see this a little bit later, but it's very often to take an if else statement and shortcut it into a ternary statement. That if this is true, then we're gonna return the left side of the colon. If it's false, we return the right side. But ultimately, we just have this Boolean expression that if this is true, we do one thing. If it's false, we'll go. All right, we have a few other variations of this. Um, I would say the big one that I use fairly frequently is the switch operator. And so what this does is it just says, I'm going to evaluate this expression or this property. And if it equals add, I'm gonna do this thing. If it equals subtract, I'm gonna do this other thing multiply, divide, and if it doesn't equal anything, then I'm just gonna return a default value. And so this one is, I think too much fun that I'm just gonna jump in here. And I'm just gonna do this real quick. And so let's go const add equals a, b, And we'll go A plus B. And I'm just gonna copy this a couple times. So we'll go sub multiply divide. Okay, and so this is minus and so notice I'm just creating some verbs. We'll go multiply and divide. And so this is actually, and it's, if you were gonna build a calculator, you could probably you know, use something like this. So switch or let's go calculate. It's gonna take A, B and operation. And then from here, switch operation and we'll go case, add, case, subtract. And I'm kind of doing a broad like crosscut on this for time, but multiply, case, divide. And then we'll do default, which if nothing matches, it just returns, it just basically defaults to this. And so here we'll just go return 42, okay? And then from here, what we're going to do is return 
add A and B. Return, subtract A and B. And we kind of see where this is going. Multiply A and B, good times. Almost done. Return, divide A and B. And I'm going to go const. And I'm going to turn this into a fat arrow function here. There we go. Okay. So now I've set the stage. And I'm just going to go result. So we can actually see this equals. And we'll go... Calculate, let's go one, two, I'm trying to think of something that'll work across all. Um, we'll go with add. And let's just dump out result. This is gonna be super anticlimactic, but we can see here, it's basically comparing the operation and then it's dropping down and performing some method. Subtract. Multiply, I think we get the point here, and so on. So the big thing here is we're just comparing each case to the operation, and then based on that, it does something. And so somebody mentioned uh, method lookup. I think that's viable, um, and I think it's out of scope of kind of what we're talking about here. Uh, it breaks the narrative arc, but I definitely think, um, you know, I have used like dynamic method lookup. All right. So back to the slides. Oh, look, here we are. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna just, I'm gonna build this out real quick. So I'm creating a reducer, I'm taking state, I'm taking action, and then we're doing some stuff. So I'm gonna just build this out and I'm gonna talk about it versus looking at slides. So let's get rid of this here. Good times, it was super awesome knowing you reducer equals, and this takes state and an action. And then what it's going to do is based on the action type, it's going to do something. So in this case, let's go with, um, so let's think about like what kind of operations or what kind of things would you want our feature to do? Well, if you had clients or projects, you would probably want to load them. So let's go with load. And let's go with, um, you know, if you had a, an array of clients or projects, you'd probably want to be able to select one. So we'll go with select. Um, you probably want to create a client or a project, update. So we kind of see where this is going, you know, create, read, update, delete. And so delete. And then we'll just do default. And so default, we'll just return state. If not, then we're going to do something in here. So if it's load, um, we'll perform one method and if it's select, create, update, or delete, we're going to form another method. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a method and I'm going to create a couple methods. So I'm just gonna generate these pretty quick. Um, and you'll start to see that they're, they're fairly, like they all follow the same shape. So let's go with load clients and it's gonna take state and payload and then from here what I'm going to do is I'm just going to return state and then I'm going to just do a console log loading clients so nothing fancy here we're not actually doing anything in this just yet but I'm going to copy this out how many more do I have four more all right. 
And I'm going to stack these up just to not take up so much space. So in your mind, it's, it won't hurt to kind of think about where I'm going with this. Select a client. It's a single client. And so I want to get a client, select client. And then what do I want to do here? Well, I want to create a client. And let's go update client and delete client, okay? Create. All right, so now we kind of stub these out is we can just go return load clients and we're just going to pass in state and action payload. Now what I want to point out here is I've written a lot of code but I'm still doing the same basic things. Methods, nouns, verbs, and conditions. Nothing fancy at all. So, load clients, select client, create client, update client, and it looks like I forgot to do delete client. All right, so here it is. So based on the action type, then we're basically performing some action. And so the reason, again, you know, someone could say, well, you know, switch statements are not optimal. I would say, you know, possibly I agree. Um, at the same time, for the sake of this, Example, it's very easy to see the conditions. We're doing case, you know, load, select, create, update, and delete. And so the reason why we return in the case is because we want to call this and then basically capture whatever this returns. And so this is going to do something that we're going to need for later. So this is going to be just a small piece that you're going to have to trust me that we're going somewhere with this. But the idea is that, and I can help clarify this, is that this is going to take client's state. And so we're always going to pass in client state and it's going to return client state. And so the idea is that I'm going to call some, I'm going to call this, it's going to do something. And then notice here, it's returning state every single time. And so you always know what you're going to get. And so this is why we are returning it is because we're passing in state and some operation we want to perform. And then we're going to get state back. And so that's why we're doing that. So from here, Let's tighten this up just a little more. So action, what is this? What is this object? So you'll notice here, I'm referring to type and payload. And so we can infer what it is, but we can, I would say, if you look at this right here, it's kind of a white belt level. Like we're doing it, but it could definitely be better. So the first thing I wanna do, I'm going to create an interface and I'm gonna call it action. And this is going to take, well, type, which is gonna be string, payload, and let's make this optional, and this could be anything. And so the idea is that it's going to take an action object, and it's going to have type, it's gonna have payload. So now I can come here, and I can say this, whatever I pass it in, it's always going to be an action object. And so now without, if I take this away, 
well, it's going, to th- it's going to throw an error here. It's going to notify me. But more importantly, we know what this does. We have a pretty good idea of what's happening in the sense of I'm going to pass in client state object and an action object, and I'm going to get a client state object back. And so without seeing the code, we very clearly have, do- have essentially conveyed our intent or signaled our intent of what this does. And so there's one other thing we can do here. You'll notice here that we have these kind of magic strings like load, select, create, update, and delete. And so typically I try to avoid these. So if I see this, like I'm essentially performing some operation on some magical string, then what I do is, and there's some different ways to do this. Um, for this case, I'm just going to do this. So we'll just go clients load equals, um, and we'll go client. And so I'm going to create just a string and we'll go load. And so this string actually is somewhat descriptive. So not only that is we're saying this is a more descriptive type. And then what I can do here is instead of doing load, I can put this in here. And so we're not using a magic string here anymore, but now we've abstracted this, abstracted this out into a client. And so, yes, absolutely. You could definitely use an enum here. Um, I've actually used even, you know, classes, um, you know, strongly typed classes. You know, there's a lot of different ways. This is, um, this is kind of a, a, like a basic, you know, kind of a level of this. So um, definitely. So, you can definitely put in some links and everything's like, Hey, like this could be better or whatever. Like I totally agree. Um, but for the narrative arc, um, absolutely. You could definitely use enums, very, you know, a very applicable use case. I've even used like classes and then created like a TypeScript union on that as well. So we'll go clients loan, um, client select. And so this is where programming becomes super fun to just watch. So I feel compelled to make jokes while I'm doing this. Update, delete. So I think I got everything here. Yeah. And so that, the reason why I'm doing this is just so it's descriptive, self-documenting. And um, so if somebody needs to like, well, what actually was this action type? Well, you can see here that, you know, if you need to debug this, then you can, you can look in and see it. Almost done. And then we will do one more quick challenge and then we will do our last module, delete client. All right. So now let's get rid of these magic strings here. We'll go client. Select, client, create. Client update and client delete. All right. And so now what I can do is, for instance, I could say result equals producer and we'll pass in initial client state and let me create um, oh yes thank you uh, so this would be That would have created some unintended consequences there uh, had we not caught that. So thank you very much. And then from here, I'm going to create, I'm going to do this inline, but we'll go and we'll go type is, we'll go client select, why not? And we don't really need a payload right now, but Let's check the result, save this. 
And notice, well, we're just returning initial state, but more importantly is if I go up here, that you'll see, let me just save this one more time, that this method right here, up here, select client was fired. So that's where this comes in is that we're saying we need to take the state, we need to reduce it into a new state and you know, based on the type of action. And so the reducer is like an air traffic controller saying, oh, go and actually take this and drop it in here and, and go find the appropriate method, look it up and do it. So with that said, let's go to our challenge. All right, so again, hopefully you were following along. Uh, what I want you to do is create a reducer function that accepts state and action at a switch statement that evaluates um, action type, add a condition for load, create, read, update, and delete, create an appropriate method for each condition that accepts state and action payload. So you can just return state from now um, as well. You don't have to, I would say, for the sake of time, you don't have to do every single one of them. Um, and uh, bonus, you know, if you get a chance, create an action interface and action type constant. So let me see what happens if I, I feel bad. This is a lot of code. Let me see here if I can kind of, I'm going to break my rule just a bit. And I'm going to, let me see if this is going to completely destroy this. So I'm going to leave this up here, and um, I think if you just did, so you don't really have to do select, create, update, or delete uh, for now, um, but I would definitely like everybody to create a reducer that takes state and action, and then a switch case on type, and then uh, from there, you know, at a minimum, let's do load, and that... Um, it returns, it can just return state for right now. As you can see here. So I'm going to leave this up here. We are doing very good on time. Let's, this is because it's a little bit of a longer one. Let's just take a 10 minute break. Let's uh, attack this, but you're going to do it for projects. So I'm doing it for clients. Please do it for projects. Uh, 820, my time. Uh, so let's take a 10 minute break. Uh, please get as much of this done as possible. And we will be back in 10 minutes. All right. I'm going to start just a minute early because I know on the East Coast, I realize it's starting to get late. And so just so we don't have everybody out, you know, till well past midnight, um, I would, I think I'm going to just kind of skip just a little bit just to get to my main points. And um, just so everybody who wants to stay up, um, you know, has an opportunity to do that, but they are not infringing on their opportunity for success in the morning. So um, yeah, it's in quarantine. What is there to do? Time stands still. So with that said, again, you know, everybody's time is precious. And so I, I think it's, you know, to me, you know, it's, it's really an honor that you know, everybody would come and spend three hours hanging out with me. So um, I don't take that lightly. All right. So moving along, the last module in this workshop the final piece is collections and iterators so we've talked about nouns verbs and decisions which is data objects or data structures functions and if else switch statements etc and so the last piece is what if we need to do something more than once? So collections and iterators is really the ability to repeat an action over a collection of objects in a predictable fashion. So let's wax the car. So this is a classic for loop. And it's saying, let's start with the variable of i. 
let's create a variable length len let's evaluate it to the client's length then uh, as long as i is less than length we're going to essentially iterate over these numbers and then we're going to do something so this is a classic for loop and i absolutely hate it the reason being is the for loop is completely detached from the collection that it's iterating over. And so there are occasions, rare edge cases, where you need it. But typically, you would imagine if I'm iterating over a collection, you know, so if I have a $100 bill, you know, $101 bills, and I'm going one, two, three, at any given time, if I wanna know what dollar I'm on, or what, you know, what dollar is currently I'm counting, I just have to look in my hand versus saying one, two, and then I have to go and, and look it up against the collection. And so I think the classic for loop is not a great way to iterate over a collection versus these higher order functions like, for instance, for each. It says for each client and the client's array do this thing. This, when I read this, makes a lot more sense because the array is doing the iterating and it has knowledge of where it is in the sequence. Just as much if I'm counting dollar bills, anytime I wanna know what the current dollar is, I just have to look in my hand. Same thing here versus I have this weird construct that doesn't actually know anything about what it's iterating over. And so you have a, a couple high order functions that I use a lot. So for each is one. Uh, filter. And so this is a way of just saying, I want to iterate over this collection. And I only want to match, or only want to return the elements that match this criteria. So what's interesting is, what is this right here? Client ID is not equal to inactive client ID. <gasps> well, it's a condition. We have a condition in here. And what is this right here? Well, this is just a method. It's anonymous, but you know we're passing a client and we're returning. You know, if it passes, it's being returned back. My stuff filter. It's also it's a higher order function, but it's iterating over this collection. So we're starting to see these things kind of come together where we look and we're like, oh, like this makes total sense. What's happening here? And so. You know, you look at client side filter and what's happening here, and it may seem advanced, but like we've already talked about kind of everything that's in here. It's we're basically doing, we're calling a method for every item in the client's collection. And then we're returning a property if, or returning this client object if this evaluates to true. So map, this is another one I use a lot. So what this does is it essentially loops over a collection, performs a function, and then returns a new collection. So in this case, we're saying, this would be, imagine I take, I'm gonna poach clients. I just loop over and I say, the client company is now mine. <laughs> Clients.reduce. So we see this one here. This is a little bit more advanced, but it's very much like the reduce function we wrote is, it allows, it basically passes an accumulated value back into itself. And so a reduce basically allows you to take a collection and reduce it down to a single value. So if I wanted to essentially say, I need to get you know, the sum of, of you know, every item in this collection, I would just call reduce, really simple. And so these are higher order functions that allows you to iterate over collections and know things about them versus you know this ridiculous thing of you know pass you know this is a very concise clean way to perform operations on a collection i'm going to take a small detour here this is bonus this did not this does not cost you anything this is free of charge but i just want to put this out here immutable operations so you want to favor immutable operations over mutable operations so let's say I wanted to add 
something to a collection. So in case I want to add like action payload, let's assume this is a widget and I want to add it to the state collection. Well, I could do state.push. That mutates the array. It takes the array and it changes it. And so anybody else that's referencing that array is now going to essentially have that mutation. And so you want, there's a lot of reasons to avoid it, but this is a mutable operation. It's changing or mutating the array that you're working with. If I wanted to update something, what I would pretty much do is I'd loop through the collection and I would say, when I find the thing that I want to update, I'm just going to chop it out and put a new one in. So state.splice, guess what? Mutable, delete. Same thing, I wanna loop over and find the thing I wanna delete, I'm just gonna splice it out. Mutable, all right, so let's talk about the immutable versions of this. And so this, for me, this is, I got this from Dan Abramoff on an ACAD video. He has a really great uh, course there. And he's, it, I think it was like less than 17 or something. He's talking about taking mutable operations and doing the immutable equivalents of them. And it was just like, pew. the reason being is you can do immutable operations and it's not any more work than doing it in a mutable fashion. So if you want to add something to an array and you want to do it in a mutable fashion, you use concat. So state, let's say array.concat, you put your new thing in and it just returns a new array. So if we look in the MDN, so that's a Mozilla developer network, it says the concat method is used to merge two or more arrays. This method does not change the existing array, but instead returns a new array. So key on that, returns a new. Typically, if you're reading the docs and it says returns a new, it's a pretty good indication this is an immutable operation. So here we're doing state docking cat payload. And what it does is say, I'm going to take this and I'm going to take this. I'm going to put together a new array. Boom. You're good to go. Create item. Up here, this is just a, a shortcut. You're basically saying, I'm going to create a new array. This is what the brackets are. And then you're doing dot dot state. In this case, so whatever it is, it's just spreading that existing array into the, the new array and then appending this new item to the end of it. Uh, in terms of performance, so John has a question about performance for loop, you know, more efficient than math reduced filter. That I think is, it really depends on what you're doing in your map reduce and filter, because I could certainly write a classic for loop and make it incredibly inefficient. Um, so, you know, this is one of these things of, you know, that there's the saying, uh, make it work, make it right, make it fast. And I find a lot of times, you know, people, you know, they, they kind of get into these religious arguments and they haven't even, you know, made their, their application work. And so um, definitely if you're writing an application where their performance is a problem, certainly you can benchmark it. But typically on modern computers, um, you know, it's pretty safe to use either or. So it just really depends on what you're doing. And more importantly, it depends on what's happening inside the, uh, the function that's in there. So um, I think you may take a small performance hit, but in most cases, it's, um, I think it's so negligible that it really doesn't, you know, make sense. And JavaScript engines are becoming more and more performant. And so you're just seeing those, those kind of disparities, you know, really converge. And, um, and so this is that kind of a thing is not something, you know, unless I'm doing something really, really intense, I don't worry about it. So let's look at how do we update an item? So this is pretty cool. We have two things here. And the first one is map. So what this does is it loops over an array and it performs some kind of operation. Let's look at the description. The map method creates a new ding ding array with the results of calling a provided function on every element in this array. So we're mapping over, we're saying looping over this and give me a new array. And then from here, oh, look at this. This is where you see this 
ternary kind of condition, you know, if these match, do this. If not, just return the existing item. So we're looping over, we're trying to find what item do we want to update? And when we find it, we're using object.assign. Well, what does this do? Well, the object.assign method is used to copy the values of all enumerable own properties from one or more source objects to a target object. It will return the target object. The target object in this case is this empty brace. So we're saying, take this empty object, copy everything on the item object over. So it goes from basically starts left and it moves over right and it keeps copying things over. But whatever's on the payload, copy that over on top of that. And so essentially you are looping over, creating a new array using objects that assign, you're creating a new object. Now, there's some caveats to this. I have not ran into this in the wild, but it, it is possible that this is good for shallow copy. So in other words, if you have an object that is referencing other objects, it's not going to copy those. So um, I, I think typically if you have deeply nested objects, that could be you know, an indicator that possibly there's a design flaw. I'm not saying there is, but typically my objects are pretty, or my collections are pretty shallow and my objects are shallow. So it does essentially a shallow copy. It, you're referencing another object, it's not going to copy that over. So just bear that in mind. If you need to do like a deep clone, um, there's libraries that, that do that, um, such as Ramda, Immutable JS. And so there's ways around that. I've personally never had to use those, but this is how you update an item in a collection. So first of all, you map over it to get a new collection. When you find the item you want to update, you just essentially create a new object and copy those properties over to it. Last one, filter. So this one is really easy. I want to delete something. Well, the filter method creates a new array with all elements that pass the test. Oh, we saw it, creates a new array that passed the test implemented by the provided function. So what it does is it loops over and it only returns, um, it only returns the items that pass it. So if we would basically you're doing say give every, return everything that doesn't match this. And so it's just basically leaving the thing you want to delete out and returning a new array with that uh, missing. So do I recommend recursion for deep cloning on nested data structures? Um, Honestly, no, I would, I would just use a library. Uh, there's a lot of really, really smart people that have spent a lot of time creating libraries to do this. I would never, um, unless there was a really good reason, I personally would not you know, take it upon myself to deep clone um, a data structure. So, I mean, that's why like Ramda and Immutable JS and a few other things exist is like they've solved that problem and they probably, I would wager are using recursion. So one other thing you can use here, um, just a kind of a bonus on top of the bonus is uh, object freeze. And so occasionally um, if you wonder like, am I doing something immutable or I wanna prevent a mutable operation, you can freeze that object using object.freeze. So uh, I think it's pretty cool uh, from the MDN. In essence, the object is made effectively immutable. The method returns the object being frozen. All right, here we go. So let's get down to business. What we have here is we want to create a new client. Well, how do we do that? So using our client or in your case projects method we want to create a client. In other words, we want to add it to the client's array. Well, how do we do that? Well, using the spread operator. And so in the create client method, we want to essentially update the client's property on the state object. And so we say, take the new client and just return this as a new array. So how would we update a client? So if we think back to the bonus bonus section we just went on, well, we want to update a client. Well, how do we do this? Well, we want to map over the client's array, find the client we want to update, 
And then once we find it, we want to create a new object, clone the properties, and then return that in its place. So just before I go to the next slide, think about the method you would use to delete a client. And uh, what would that be? Well, filter. So what we want to do is on our client's array, which is on our state uh, property, we're just going to loop over. We're going to find this is the client we want to delete. Filter it out. No problem. Makes sense? So if we want to add a client, we just are, we're basically concatenating a new one onto the end of it. If we want to update a client, we're mapping over, find the thing that we want to update and creating a new clone of the updated client in this case. And if you want to delete a client, you're just looping over the clients and saying, I just want to leave out the thing that I want to delete. And so we're just going to leave it out. We're going to have a new array minus the thing that you want to delete. So let me write some code. Let's see this. So I talk a little bit and then I write it. And then as you can imagine what the next challenge is going to be. So hopping over into the code base here, let's go with create client. So what we want to do here, so let me also, I'm going to strongly type this. And so every one of these methods, we want to make sure that, and so this is where TypeScript comes in, it's handy, is like this. And so we're always returning client state. So for create client, we're going to go return and client, and we're going to go state.clients. And so we're essentially creating a new object we're saying we want to take and create a new array and we're going to go with payload. And so we're presuming in this case, payload is a client object. And then what we're also going to do is we are going to just leave current client alone because we're not actually doing anything with that. So we'll just go state dot current client. No problem. And so when we, call create client, we pass in state and payload, and the payload being a new client, we're saying update the client's array immutably and just add this to the end of a new array. And then from here, let's go update. So this is kind of the, the verbose one. And I'm gonna just copy this over and because I think we're here to learn how to program, not how to type, and honestly, I think typing is super tedious. Um, so what would we do here? Well, what is the method we use to update or the approach for that? Well, we'll go state.clients because this is what we want to update, map. And then from here, we're going to go client. And then, so we're basically creating a new array. We're returning it using map. And then we'll go return. And so we get this ternary operator here, client ID equals payload dot ID. And so we're just saying, go find the client that we actually want to update. And then from here, we're going to, if it does match, we'll go object dot assign. We're gonna start with a brand new clean object, client and payload. If not, so if we don't need to update it, we're just going to return uh, a new client. Boom, done. And let me see here, one more left. We actually, I'm gonna finish all these just for fun. Um, return. And so hopefully now, like I'm trying to do this in a way that people are starting to be like, ah, I know where he's going with this. This is, this is not a magic trick anymore. I know exactly what's happening. Um, we'll go state dot current client because we're not dealing with this. 
and we'll go client and let's go state.client filter client and we're just going to match client ID equals payload ID. All right, so some of my East Coast homies are falling off, but everybody who said uh, the kind words, I appreciate it, thank you so much. Definitely, I'll send the slides out. Um, if you're not too sleepy, if you stick around for another 15 minutes, we'll get to the grand finale. All right, so hopefully this makes sense for create client, update client, and delete client. So this is where we're iterating over the clients and we're doing something. We're either adding a client to it, we're updating a client, or we're deleting a client by filtering it out. And so let's go ahead and finish these two other ones. So I, I think we can start to think about this. Um, Ooh, Roseanne, you might be right. Yes, I would have completely wiped out that collection. So <laughs> humans are fallible. All right, so let's get into load clients. And so in your mind, follow along, try to just anticipate what I'm going to do here. So Again, we're not dealing with current client. We don't care about that. So we're just going to set this. But you can imagine that we're saying, okay, we have these clients. I want to load them in. So we're just going to leave this one alone. And instead, what we want to do is just say clients equals payload. So we just assume this is where it's a little murky. Um, but payload can kind of be anything. In this case, it's going to be a client's array. And so I could even type this if I wanted, um, but for consistency, we'll just leave this. I may, you know, potentially at some point, you know, I could possibly go back and, and refactor it, uh, but I try to program in a very iterative fashion. And so from here, well, guess what? We're dealing with a single client. And so in this case, we've selected a client. So I'm gonna go clients. Um, I'm not gonna touch this, state.clients, but instead we're gonna go current client equals payload. And so now whatever client we put in is going to be the current client. Hopefully this makes sense. And so really what I wanted to kind of dial in here is these three methods right here is that we have state that has a collection on it and we need to update it. Okay, so we've done a lot of stuff here. Nouns, verbs, conditions, iterators. I think we're here. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip this last challenge. Um, everybody's getting the slides, so I think you can follow along. Grand finale. All right, so I think somebody has probably figured out what we're building. If not, not a problem. So if you haven't heard of Redux, you most definitely will. That I would say in terms of state management, every major framework has a library based off of the React pattern or the Redux pattern. So Redux was created by Dan Abramoff. Capital R is for React. Angular has a version of it uh, called NGRX, um, loosely speaking but it's the pattern based off of Redux. Uh, Vue has one as well. And so Redux is a very, very powerful state management library. And I've used it hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, and hundreds if not thousands of times across a lot of very large clients, Capital One, American Airlines, a bunch of places um, that building large applications in my case, NGRX, I've also, again, used Redux uh, for React applications, but Redux is one of the most, I would say, important kind of 
frameworks or patterns to emerge in the last couple of years in terms of simplifying state management. It is incredible. And so if you've been following along, what we have basically created is Redux. You have watched me over the course of three hours build a version of Redux from the ground up. And so the beauty of Redux is you can actually write it in about 10 minutes or a version of it. And so taking the most complicated, the most or complicated, but certainly the most important state management library and pattern in the last couple of years. And by applying these principles, we have basically wrote a version of this from scratch. And so let me prove this. The difference is if I go back up to the store and I'm going to make a few small modifications to this. I'm going to add a dispatch method and it's going to take an action. And then inside this dispatch method, we're going to go this state equals this reducer, and I'll get to this in just a second, this dot state and action. All right. So let's go up here and we need to add this reducer. And we'll just leave this untyped. And so we'll go state and reducer. And we'll go this dot reducer equals reducer. And oh, looky here. This is angry. So I'm going to move this down to the bottom so we can see this in its entirety. So all I've done here is I've added the reducer to the store and I have this dispatch method that just calls the reducer method and passes in the current state and just the action object in it. Okay, so now reducer. And let me split this back up. Oops. Well, now I have to figure out. Oh, I think it's over. Hold on just a second. drug that off to the side and now I do not it's gonna let me open this or not well we won't worry about that for just a second I'll just split the screen if I have to and so we have store and I'm passing in state and reducer super awesome and so now let me go and we're doing current client, client store, select. So I'm just getting the current client. Let me go here. Oops. Current client. Let me just save this and let me refresh this. Hopefully, oh yeah, I got it back. All right, so we can see the current client. Yeah, there we go, Winston, on top of it. All right, so now, current client. Okay, well, what do I wanna do now? Well, let me update the current client. So um, let me see if I have another object up here, client. Okay, I'm going to do John Wick. Put this in here. All right. Now check this out. I'm going to get rid of this, and we're going to go store.dispatch, and we're going to pass in an object. And so we're going to go type 
and we want to select a client and then we're going to go payload John Wick. Okay, and let's see what this angry this is about. So this is, I think I called this client store. Let me just double check. Um, <laughs> yes, client store. There we go. Okay. New current client equals client store select current client. Lo and behold, now I'm able to get the new current client. Now what I can do is let's go up here and I'm gonna create another client. So let's go, uh, what have I been into lately? You know what, I'm gonna keep this simple. We'll just go Jane Smith equals ID 10, first name is Jane, last name is Smith. All right, now let's add this in to our collection. So we'll go Client store, dispatch. We're going to put an action in here. So we're going to go type client create payload is Jane Smith. And let's go clients, client store, select. Okay, so now if I go to updated clients, so we'll just dump this out. You can see here, John Wick, Miles Morales, and Jane Smith. Redux, boom, wadata, sign on the pana line. And there we have it. So the whole point that I wanna make is when I learned Redux, or I was trying to wrap my mind around it. It took me three weeks. It was really hard. And then I realized, like, why is this so hard? When, in fact, all I'm doing is these same four things over and over and over. Like, everything that is in this is nothing more nouns, verbs, conditions, iterators. And this is what I do at an architect level day in and day out. And it doesn't matter what framework I'm using. And so when you fall in love, when you really understand like the fundamentals, that's when you become really effective at problem solving. And again, I just keep coming back to, you know, remember we're on that, that post and why are we doing this is because when you get into these situations, all of a sudden these things assemble and it's like, oh, like I know why and how this works. And we have in a matter of three hours with a lot of commentary from the ground up, basically built Redux from scratch. And that is, ta-da, I would say, Believe it or not, if you really start to understand this and apply it, the leap between being a new programmer and a seasoned programmer is very, it's much, much smaller than you think. It's, it's not that you have to learn new, big, fancy things. It's really committing to the fundamentals and learning how to put those together in very predictable ways. And so I, I would imagine anybody who was watching me was like, oh my goodness, like this is basic programming 101, but 
at the end of the day, well architected code, high quality code is under the hood. It's very basic and it's very boring. But what that allows you to do is create great software that people love and they care about and it impacts them in a very, very meaningful way. And so I think the one last thought that I would leave you with is, this is not in my notes, but I feel compelled to say this, is as I'm presuming a lot of you in this room with me tonight are students or you're learning to become programmers. And I think it's really important to understand why do we program? And like, why do we do what we do? And it's really easy to, I love flow charts as well. That's funny. <laughs> Is it, It's really easy to become enamored with like a technology that's like super hot. And so you'd be like, oh, like I program because of React or I program because of Angular or I program because of this. And at the end of the day, I think if we're honest with ourselves, we don't stay up at two in the morning because we're in love with React or Angular or Node or, or whatever it is, is we program to create things that impact people in a really, really meaningful way. Whether you're solving a, a problem that is causing a lot of pain for somebody. So right now uh, with the, the pandemic, I am I'm deeply involved in a, a platform that streamlines really the loan process for like Main Street kind of, you know, businesses where, you know, these small mom and pop shops, because that's important to me. And so that's why I program. It's not because I love typing at two in the morning. Alvaro does like, I applaud that weird fetish. Um, but at the end of the day, like we create things because it matters to people and it, it makes their life easier. It makes their life better. Um, it even brings novelty. So I have small kids and I guarantee you when my kids are acting up in a restaurant and I pass on that, you know, that weird pop a bubble game or whatever it is. Like, I'm so glad that that person wrote that app that my five-year-old is in love with and everybody else in the restaurant is as well. So just kind of, as I leave this is I think as programmers, sometimes we make the mistake of focusing on the wrong things up here, which is frameworks and you know fancy new things. And we don't pay enough attention to the things at the bottom, which is like, why do we do what we do when that should be reversed? And I think when you focus on how do I create things that really matter to people and that are gonna stand the test of time, then these shiny things kind of fall off and you start to really embrace the fundamentals and you're able to do things like what we just did for the last three hours is taking very basic principles and use them to create non-trivial enterprise level applications. And so on that, I love each and every one of you. I really, really appreciate and Winston cracking me up. Uh, hit me up on Twitter. It's Simpleton. Um, I work for Brebug. Um, I'm the VP of developer uh, growth. So basically what I'm doing here is the same thing Will's doing. I've pretty much invested my whole life into making great developers. And, um, you know, to that, uh, really with Code Smith and for this opportunity, I just, I can't say thank you enough. And well done. <laughs>